Welcome to the war from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, send it to me, uh, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Today we're going to feature two more episodes of Soldiers of the Press from May 9th and May 23rd of 1943, based on stories filed by Walter Cronkite and Clinton Conger. Soldiers of the Press. This week, dry martini. This is Reichsrundfunk, DJW Berlin speaking. We almost got the American bomber ace martini on Monday. We'll get him next time if he dares come back over Europe again. Oh, get a load of that fat head behind him. Well, that fat punk, Daring, he and his whole Air Force are washed up, and yet they challenge us to come out and fight. That lousy microphone, Jackie. There's a dramatic story behind that Berlin radio challenge to the heroic crew of the Flying Fortress Dry Martini. It's a story that comes to us from United Press correspondent Walter Cronkite. Recently, you heard Cronkite's story of his own flight with a fortress bombing Wilhelmshaven. Cronkite is assigned to a flying fortress base somewhere in England, and he knows the men of the plane whose name is Dry Martini and whose insignia is a brimming cocktail glass. This is the story of one of those men, told by United Press correspondent Walter Cronkite. The crews that fly America's flying fortresses are among the best trained combat teams in the fighting forces. They're keen, alert, and every man knows his job like he'd been born for it. What's more, they're all swell guys, regular, fun-loving. Real American lads who have a grim and dangerous job to do and do it. And they ask nothing better than a chance to keep on carrying the fight to the enemy and the skies over Europe. Second Lieutenant Woody Clark is one of those guys. He's a navigator and a good one. His ship is the Dry Martini. I met him outside Operations Headquarters that Monday morning... Just before the briefing began, a cold wind was sweeping across the field, and a fine rain was falling. Hiya, Woody. What's good about it? I didn't say anything was good about it. Matter of fact, I think it's a stinking morning. That make you feel any better? Well, at least it's a realistic attitude. Okay, we're realistic. So, suppose you tell me the correct time. Look, what's the matter, Cronkite? Can't you manage a watch that'll tell time on your expense account? Hi, Woody. Hey, Hi, what's kid. eating you this morning, anyway? All I ask for is the time. You act like I was asking you for the secret of the Norden bomb site. Oh, I'm sorry. I guess I'm just on edge. Okay, get out that waterbury of yours and we'll set it. All right. It's, uh, hi, kids. 5.47 less 15 seconds. Less ten. Less five. Got it? Check. Thanks. Okay. You know, I don't blame you for being jumpy. I've only been up on one mission, and I'm not making this one, but... I can't help getting butterflies every time. Oh, it's not that exactly. I I guess I'm sore at myself more than anything else. What did you do? Buy a half interest in Buckingham Palace last trip to London? No, I just haven't clipped any... Coupons off Gehring Preferred and about a dozen trips out. I, well, I'm beginning to think I don't know how to use that pea shooter I got up there in the greenhouse. So that's what's bothering you. You haven't claimed any German planes yet. Yep, I guess that's it. Everyone else with a gun station aboard the dry martinis picked off at least one. Well, I'm beginning to feel self-conscious. Now, isn't that too bad? No folk of wolves or Messerschmitts to your credit. Don't you consider it a bit of an accomplishment to bring that three-quarter million dollar kite home safe each time? Well, I still want to claim an enemy plane. I'm going to do it this time, too, or I'm going to ask for service with a ground crew. You'll nail one, Woody. I can feel it. We'll celebrate with an honest guy steak. Now, come on. Snap out of it. <laughs> uh, thanks, Mother. I guess I'm just the moody type. Come on, you guys. Pile in and look alive. Briefing's about to begin. Come on, Cronkite. Let's go. Right. <laughs> Okay, men, pipe down and perk up. Now, as I told you last night, our objective is Paris in the spring. But there won't be any tra-la, tra-la atmosphere about it. You all know the importance of this raid. It's a tough assignment. 
You know your plan of attack, and you've all had your instructions. So there's no need to go into that again. You'll have fighter protection going out to the limit of their range. And they'll pick you up at the same approximate point on your return. Intelligence reports there isn't much flack over Paris, but Gehring's boys will throw the book at you coming back. Question. What about these fragmentation bombs the German fighter planes have been using against fortresses? They may employ them again. Probably will. But experience indicates they're no more effective than ACAC fire. If one explodes near you, it's bad. But your principal worry will be the enemy fighter. You'll take off As the briefing continued, covering point-by-point point instructions, I made notes like the pilots and crews. The information available at a briefing is mighty valuable when you start writing your story of the raid. I could see Woody grimly scribbling on his pad. And I could tell he was still tense and sore. The target for the day was the big Renault plant near Paris, used by the Germans as an aircraft engine factory. The promise of heavy opposition from any of the pursuits indicated that Woody would have ample opportunity to try for the scalp of one of Goering's boys. The briefing lasted more than half an hour before the wing commander said, That's all, unless there are other questions. Very well, then. School's out. Go on out and turn them over. And drop those bombs right down the smokestacks. Bye, Woody, and good luck. I'll have that steak waiting for you, so do your stuff. Okay, I like them rare and two inches thick. As the crews piled into the waiting trucks that would take them to their planes, I made my way to the bomber wing headquarters. It was raining, and I wiped the moisture from the window that overlooked the field. The planes were taxiing onto the runways. I could see their green and red recognition lights dimly through the fog. One by one, I could see them race down the runway. Then the first one zoomed directly overhead and faded into the dawn. They came over in rapid succession after that. Their motors blended into a continuous roar that died away gradually. The dry martini was on her way, with Woody up there in the greenhouse, busy with his charts and instruments. There was nothing to do now but wait. I walked back to the operations office. All off on time, Hap? Yeah. Take off smooth as clockwork. What time they do over the target? Zero eight hundred and twenty. Mind if I park myself here and keep an eye on the show? Of course not. Pull up a chair, make yourself comfortable. Long wait. The operations office is the heart of a bomber base. In it, intelligence and operations officers lay out the objectives and plot the flights. Over its battery of phones. Reports come in from the aircraft spotters on the movements of planes, our own and the enemy. And through it move all the reports on every mission. Across one end of the room spreads a huge map, and on it, big black-headed pins mark the position of every bomber in the squadron. Every 15 minutes, the time is called off, and the pins are moved into new positions. Time, 715. Map reference, H3207. They're out over the channel now and high upstairs. 30,000 feet in the frigid thin air of the substratosphere. I listen to the reports come in and watch the black pins edging toward the target. They pass Boulogne, Abbeville, Amiens, Saint-Denis. Time, 0810. Map reference, Q4360. That's 10 minutes from the target now. Up in the glass in nose of the bomber, it's time for Woody to put aside the charts and get set behind that pea shooter of his. For it's a cinch to be tough from here on. I stick around until the pins are directly over Paris. I go outside for a smoke and a cup of coffee and try to relax. The hands of my watch seem to crawl. I know they're on their way back now, and I keep wondering if Woody is having any luck against Goering's boys. At 10 a.m., I duck into operations. Hello, Hap. How's it going? Fighter escort took off half an hour ago to meet him. We should be hearing from him any time now. That'll be a relief. You know, in some ways, it's tougher staying behind than it is being up there. You can dream up too many things here. Up there, you're too busy to do much thinking about anything but essential business. Yeah, I know. Hello? Yes? Yes? Okay, got it. Spotter reports a large flight of four moated bombers identified as fortresses just crossed the coast. They're coming home. The ground crews are heading out for the field now, and the runways are being cleared for landing. I begin to feel better. About time for them to be checking with the tower. Leader to Blue Leader Control Tower. Blue Leader to Blue Leader Control Tower. Come in. Come in, please. Blue Tower here. Hello, Blue Leader. Go ahead, please. Over. Blue Squadron requests permission to land. Over. Blue Leader from Tower. 
okay to land. Using number one, three, and four runways. Wind is west, 16 miles. You bringing them all home? No, sorry, no such luck. Army 29041 dropped out of formation. She had one motor afire and reported she couldn't keep up. Off. Army 29041. I look at the operations chart and my heart skips a beat. Army 29041 is the dry martini. The planes are coming in now. Their motors are distant rumble. It grows larger and then they're visible. The sun has come through and you can see its dull reflection on the green gray of their wings. We watch them land and see the pilots and crews getting the kinks out of their legs as they head for the briefing room to make out the reports. But I keep thinking of the dry martini. Out there somewhere trying to horse it in with one motor gun. Time, 1030. All planes except Army 29041 down safely. Anything from the spotters? No, nope, not a thing. We sit silent and tense now and watch the clock. The sweep second hand on the clock in front of Hap seems to creep around the dial. Blue control tower to Army 29041. Blue control tower to Army 29041. Can you hear me? Come in. Come in. Come in. No answer. Yep. Looks bad. I was talking to Woody Clark before they took off this morning. He was down because he hadn't claimed an enemy plane. I hope he got one. Yeah, I hope he did. I promised a mistake if he did. Guess I'd better go start lining it up. They're not easy to produce. Yeah, it takes some doing. Blue Leader Control Tower from Army 29041. Boy, is that Blue good news. Blue Leader Control Tower from Army 29041. Acknowledge. Over. Tower here. Hello, Army 29041. We'd begun to think you'd washed out. Over. Now, we're going to make it. Coming in for a landing. Request your instructions. Over. Army 29041 from Tower. Okay to land. Number two runway is clear to land. Any wounded aboard? Nothing we can't walk away. But you better have an ambulance on hand. We got a left wing like a sieve and one motor's conked out. I may mess things up a bit in landing. Over and off. Okay, Army 29041. Here's luck. Off. I dashed for the door and hopped aboard the ambulance that was heading for runway number two. She was coming in now. From the ground, we could see the smoke pouring from one motor and holes the size of a wash tub through her tail surfaces. She wobbled as she came down. Her wheels touched. She lurched uncertainly. Then she righted herself and jolted to a stop. I looked at the nose. The windows in Woody's greenhouse were shot out. The pilot's windshield was shattered. The glass was gone from the tail. The cowling of two of the good motors was riddled. Then the crew began piling out. Uh, sorry, Doc. No business for you. Yeah, Doc. You can roll that butcher wagon back in the barn. Well, that's the way we like it. Had a tough time? Yeah, but a good one. We got 12 planes, Doc. Well, how do you like that? 12 planes. Lieutenant Clark rates top score. He got three. Woody got three. Man. Then I saw him poking his head through the hatch. His face was cut a bit from flying glass, but he was grinning. Oh, Cronkite. Got that steak ready? Brother, you sure rate it. What came over you, anyhow? Oh, they made me mad, I guess. They put two explosive caliber 30s right through the nose. Yeah, I noticed. Pieces of metal bounced off my steel helmet. They didn't hurt either me or the bombardier. Bullet hit my gun mount. Then I really began shooting. The next folk wolf that came in, I knocked off his propeller. The next one I got right in the middle of his gas tank, and he blew up. And then a third one came in, and somehow or other I just cut off his tail. You know, I cut it right off. Brother. I guess uh, oh, I went sour after that. I... I missed the fourth one. Yeah? Well, isn't that too bad? Well, do you want to stand around and cry about it? Or shall we go and get that steak? At the bomber bases, aboard our warships, and on the front lines with the ground forces, United Press correspondents are gathering the news, the colorful, exciting stories of United Nations fighting men in action. Be sure to hear the next program of Soldiers of the Press... Over this same station, 
Your local announcer will give you the time of that broadcast in just a moment. And meanwhile, remember to listen for United Press news on the air. Look for United Press dispatches in your favorite newspaper. They are your guarantee of the world's best coverage of the world's biggest news. Soldiers of the Press! This week, night patrol. Stand her off, Hoyt. I'm standing. Advance and make yourself known. I'm Clinton B. Conger of the United Press. Here are my credentials. Uh, what's your business here, Mr. Conger? Well, I don't know. The Admiralty informed me this afternoon that if I came down here tonight, the boys would see to it that I had an interesting time. I was told to say, strawberry control. <laughs> yes, sir. I think you'll have an interesting time, all right. Would you mind signing this, please, sir? United Press staff correspondent Clinton B. Conger signed a waiver releasing the British government from responsibility in case of injury or death. Then he was taken down deep into a great concrete structure along the waterfront. Thus began one of the many exciting adventures of United Press staff correspondents who bring you eyewitness accounts of world news as it happens. Listen to Clinton B. Conger's story of Night Patrol. Here you are, sir. Hiya, Fraser. Hey, uh, what's the pitch here? Where are we headed for? Holland. Oh, I don't want to go to Holland. They've got Germans there. <laughs> well, that's just where we're going. Just the same. They promised me an interesting time, but that's apt to be just a little too interesting. Uh, how are we getting to Holland, if I may ask? Motor torpedo boats. You know, we call them PT boats back home. Oh, murder. And I get seasick as a dog just looking at a bowl of goldfish. <laughs> I should have stood in bed. You should. <laughs> I griped loudly and fervently, but just the same, I was pretty excited about the whole thing. I was going to get my first ride on one of Britain's highly secret patrol boats that sweep across the English Channel nightly to disrupt German shipping. As I stood talking with other correspondents in the underground dock, I became increasingly certain of one thing. Before the night was out, a whole mess of Germans probably would be taking pot shots at me. I anticipated the prospect with what might be called mixed emotions. After a half hour or so, the door opened again and a Navy officer came in. He was carrying a hat. Good evening, gentlemen. I have a hat full of numbers here. Each of you will please draw one. What's the idea? The numbers will determine which of the patrol boats each of you is to accompany. Uh, will you draw, please? One by one, we drew folded slips of paper out of the hat. I picked number one, the first boat. That meant I'd be in a position to see all of the action. But it also meant I'd be in the boat that the Germans would likely concentrate their fire upon. My shirt suddenly became very tight around my neck. Who has drawn the first boat? Uh, I did. Lucky Conger, Mr. Conger. <laughs> <laughs> Will you come this way, Mr. Conger? Go right to your boss and tell him how it happened, Clint. Yeah. Thanks, you luck. <laughs> I followed the British naval officer from the underground chart room into what at first appeared to be a storeroom of some kind. It was pitch black. It smelled of gasoline. As my eyes became accustomed to the dim light, I gradually made out the outlines of one of the British Hornets, which is what they call their PT boats. We went aboard the 80-foot craft. It vibrated gently underfoot from the throbbing of its three great motors. The young ensign met us on the wing of the bridge. Uh, Mr. Selfridge, this is Clinton Conger of United Press. Very happy to know you, Mr. Conger. Glad to have you aboard. I'll let you know later whether I'm glad I came or not. Well, I think I'll leave you now, Mr. Conger. You're in good hands. I'll see you when you get back. That sounds encouraging. I'll see you later. Uh, we're about to shove off, Mr. Conger. I'm afraid I'll have to ask you to go down below to we'll see. All this is very hush-hush stuff, you know. <laughs> Sorry and all that, but there isn't any alternative. I understand. Which way do I go? Uh, Evans, uh, take Mr. Conger below and see if he's comfortable. Will I? I followed a seaman down through a narrow folding hatch that evidently was closed off during rough weather, and then down another short ladder into the crew's quarters. The seaman left me there, and I sat down, thought about life and things, about how many bullets there are flying around loose in the world that a man can get in the way of. Cast off, four and up, taking one and two. Taking it one, taking it two. All clear, stand by. Take stations for getting underway. The thin hull of the torpedo boat vibrated a trifle more, and I could faintly sense that we were moving. From time to time, I could hear orders being shouted overhead. Evidently, something was being done about a huge door. 
had the least idea of where we were or how we were going to get out to sea. And I still don't know. All I know is that after a half hour or so, the boat began pitching and tossing heavily, and I heard the officer barking, All hands put on your May West. Man battle stations. So I put on the life preserver that the seaman had given me, and I tried to make myself as comfortable as possible on that narrow bunk. After a while, the motion of the boat and the humming of the engines lulled me to sleep. Mr. Conga! Huh? Mr. Conga! Now it's only that the seaman wakened me, and I went up on deck with him. It was dark now, and I could barely see the other boats in the formation lined up behind us. I went up on the flying bridge. Did you have a good nap, Mr. Conger? Yeah. Any excitement? No, not yet. I thought I might as well let you sleep on the way out. Very dull, really. But we're getting close now. Another hour or so, we'll be in the thick of it, I shouldn't wonder. Not too thick, I hope. <laughs> well, they told us to give you fellas a good show. So we're going a bit further in than usual. We're quite likely to have a first-rate rumpus. That'll be nice. Excuse me. Uh, quartermaster, tell the engineer to stand by for emergency changes of speed. Aye, aye, sir. I watched while the quartermaster crawled aft along the narrow deck to the engine room where he opened a little hatchway in the deck. Then a head appeared in the opening. A quartermaster shouted into the ear of the engineer. He grinned, nodded, and then disappeared. I asked Selfridge about the engine room. It seemed awfully small from where we were standing. It is small. <laughs> Chaps have to crawl around on their hands and knees down there. Oh, well, there's more than one? Oh, quite. Two men, three engines. Dreadfully bad job, that. I shouldn't like to have it. Wear plugs in one's ears all the time, you know. Go deaf otherwise. Engines kick up a horrible fuss and hit top speed. You mean we aren't going top speed now? Heavens no, only about half. We can make 70 knots, you know. I didn't know, but 70 knots is a healthy 80 miles an hour. I had a sudden great respect for these boats and for the men who run them. As we raced for the Dutch coast, I looked the boat over from end to end, hanging for dear life to a railing thoughtfully provided for that purpose. The forward end of the boat was high out of the water now. The stern was dug down deep as the propeller screwed into the sea. Everywhere I looked, there were machine guns and torpedo tubes. The ensign's elbow was a small deck gun. Altogether, this was the most deadly-looking weapon of war I'd ever seen. And I was on it, hurtling at top speed toward German-occupied Holland. Rattle down! Rattle down! Just go carefully now, Mr. Conger. Fine fields all around us. Fine fields? Uh, ours or theirs? Theirs. Oh, we must be getting close. I should say so practically there, actually. The coast is a mile and a half off in that direction. I looked where he pointed, expecting the blackness to open up with the flash of gunfire. Nothing happened. I couldn't see a thing. Then Selfridge ordered the engines muffled, and an amazing quiet descended on our fleet. I was vaguely disappointed. I'd expected great things and a terrific amount of gunplay. Instead, we cruised up and down the Dutch coast as though we were in a lake back home. Seemingly, we owned the entire English Channel, and no one was in a mood to argue with us about it. Hours went by. I was on the verge of going below and returning to the arms of Morpheus when Selfridge spoke. Aha. Uh -huh. I beg your pardon? I said, aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> yes, but why? Business. A convoy. Jerry's. Where? There. I couldn't see a thing. I was about to tell Selfridge I thought he was imagining things when the night cracked wide open with a blaze of light. The Germans turned a searchlight on us. Take off the bubbles. Full speed. All right, brother. Hang on, Mr. Conger. I hung on. The torpedo boat almost leaped out from under us as the engines opened up. Then we twisted around in a complete circle faster than I can tell you about it. The searchlight tried to follow us, but couldn't. Then the whole fleet of torpedo boats dashed off in all directions. Selfridge grabbed his microphone. Hello? 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 Come in, Strawberry. All for Orange calling Strawberry. Come in, please. Hello, Jack. Strawberry here. Good boy, Tom. I think we have them rattled. You go left, I'll go right. We'll come in behind them. Is that understood? Over to you. Yes. I understand, Orange. See you later. Over and off. We raced through the darkness at full speed. I kept thinking about those minefields all around us, but evidently Selfridge didn't worry about them because we never slackened speed until we were on the other side of the German convoy. Then the mufflers were put on the motors again, and we crept slowly in towards the enemy ships. Everybody was tense and quiet. And then, dimly at first, I saw a large shape looming up ahead of us. An enemy ship. Stand by to fire torpedoes. Standing by, sir. Stand by all guns and train on target. Standing by, sir. Quietly, we edged toward the German ship. She was about a mile away when we first saw her. We covered about half the distance when a blinker light flashed at us from her bow. They're challenging us, sir. Answer them. What shall I say, sir? I don't know their code. Send anything. Just keep their minds occupied a few seconds longer until we can get in range. Aye, aye, sir. The quartermaster picked up a blinker tube and flashed an answer to the German ship, which had questioned our identity. Meanwhile, we crept closer and closer. 
Then the guns on the German ship erupted into flame, and the night was filled with whining billets. Open Nautilus, full speed. Steer collision course. All guns fire. Now our boat leaped through the water again, directly at the German ship, right into the teeth of our machine guns and three-inch shells. I ducked down below the bridge and stayed there, crouched behind the bulkhead. Occasionally, I stuck my head up for a look. The enemy ship was really a small one, but she looked bigger than a battleship from where I sat. I felt acutely unhappy, especially so since we were steering directly for the enemy ship and going like a bat out of Brooklyn. Stand by forward torpedo! Standing by! Selfridge stood up with the traces whistling around him and kept his eyes on the enemy ship. I was content to keep my eyes on Selfridge. All right, watch it now. I'm going to fire. Fire one. Fire two. Left brother, let's get out of here. Break his necks going by. We dropped our torpedoes and heeled over to get out of their way. I learned afterwards we went right by the torpedoes and kept on going past the German ship. I wasn't watching. I was huddled behind the comforting protection of the bulkhead. A few seconds after we heeled over and raced away, the whole sky seemed to fall in on us. Get out here! Did, did you see that, Mr. Conger? We got him! I thought for a second he got us, but I wasn't going to say so. I got up off my hands and knees. Selfridge helped me up. Did you fall, Mr. Conger? No, I uh, dropped my handkerchief when those bullets started whistling by. It's a nice bucket you got there. Yes, yeah, it's great. be much nicer, however, if it were armor, please. <clears throat> Isn't it? Yeah, Read not. It's just plywood. You can spit through it. I, uh, I think I'll go lie down. It was quite an adventure. Several heavy German escort vessels came out after us, and we decided to call it a night, for which I was duly grateful. On our way back to England, the ensign apologized to me for not having been able to show us more excitement. I accepted his apology. You have been listening to United Press correspondent Clinton B. Conger's story of his experiences as a reporter aboard one of the lightning-fast British motor torpedo boats that patrol the English Channel. Conger is one of a worldwide staff of United Press correspondents who are eyewitnesses to events that are news. We will bring you another program dramatizing the experiences of these men of UP in the near future. Your local announcer will give you the time of that broadcast in just a moment. Be sure to listen. And meanwhile, listen for United Press News on the air. Look for United Press dispatches in your favorite newspaper. They are your guarantee of the world's best coverage of the world's biggest news. That will do it for today. If you uh, have a comment, email me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. I welcome your story or that of loved ones who served during World War II. Ken Curlin provides our opening theme music, KenCurlin.com. I am your host, Adam Graham. This uh, series is provided as a service of the great detectives of old-time radio, greatdetectives.net.